Welcome to Mental Health Film Comment. This is Brian here with you. The 2021 film, and yay, I get to say 2021 film, uh, The Co-op, is a short film about a robber whose plans go horribly awry when he realizes that the co-op he targeted is full of disabled people. Uh, joining us today is the film's director, Cameron S. Mitchell. Uh, Cameron, thank you for uh, being here today. Thanks for having me, Brian. Excited to be on the show. Now, um, I, I want to mention a couple of resources up front, as I do every episode, because I know that often in the, in discussions of, of mental health and uh, assorted topics, that there may be um, um, Drawing a blank. That's not a good way to start a show, drawing a blank. Brain fart. Um, th th yeah, there are sometimes there are, are movies mentioned or topics or subjects mentioned that can be uh, upsetting to uh, many listeners. Right? So that's why I sort of make a point to mention some resources up front. I know that there is a crisis text line in the US. You can text HOME to 741-741. In the UK, you can text SHOUT, S-H-O-U-T, to 85258. And depending upon where you are in the world, um, check your local listings, um, as they say. Um, Cameron, thank you for uh, being here today. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, again, I I'm really excited to be here. Um, let's talk about some uh, me mental health in film. Definitely. Now, uh, slam dance. I did want to. Now I, I'm familiar with slam dance because I'm in the category of people who aren't that big of a fan of Sundance for any number of different reasons, which I probably won't get into <laughs> during this podcast. And, and I would imagine you might share some of those um, reservations. But what 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 is slam dance for those listening who who might not know? So slam dance occurs directly across the street from Sundance. I think of it as kind of a counter protest or a counter film festival to what has become the Hollywoodification that is uh, Sundance. Um, they, so they support indie filmmakers and, in, and, you know, new and original stories that are authentic uh, to the, the perspectives that portray them. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, like I said, it occurs directly across the street, same time, uh, say, you know, almost same place. Uh, and the, the festivals have a storied and controversial uh, history that goes back uh, almost as deep as, you know, being a, a Philadelphia as Pats and Geno's, you know, it's like uh, the, the warring cheesesteaks, uh, the warring film festivals. Well, yeah, and, and you mentioned, and I, I'm going to contradict myself about you know, not making too many movie comments on, on a podcast about mental health, which, um, but one of the, the, the problematic points would be a, a certain unnamed uh, movie boss who is now in prison for some not very um, nice things that he has done. Uh, that, that's one uh, prominent example and in the process uh, caused a lot of oscar races to go completely up you know up you know saving private saving private ryan lost to shakespeare in love for best picture um, that's one of the biggest head scratchers of all time probably bigger than you know, Oliver or Around the World in 30 Days or whatever that movie was, winning Best Picture or Chariots of Fire, winning over Ordinary People, which I think, Ordinary People is a movie that has just, <laughs> every every year that passes by, Ordinary People just gets more and more uh, relevant and significant and, um but enough about those other movies. Uh, what, um, what, what, what planted the seeds in your head for, for, for this movie, the, the, the co-op? 
So uh, the co-op is my directorial debut. Uh, I'm a cinematographer by trade, but uh, and a commercial director by trade. Um, you know, but I've always, like most, wanted to work in the narrative space. Um, and th this film, though, I've always been, you know, I have running ideas in my head constantly. I, you know, I should do this. I should do that. I've got 50, you know, script concepts out there. But I think, you know, as a filmmaker, one of the hardest things to do is to sit yourself down and make yourself do it. You know, you can have a million ideas, uh, but which one do you love and which one can you do in the space between all of these other, you know, other people's dreams, basically, that you're working on. Um, so the impetus for me on this was actually joining a film challenge. I put down the $25 entry fee for the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge um, because, you know, disability has been a huge part of my life uh, growing up. My, my parents are uh, professors of disability studies. Uh, my father and sister are, uh, are wheelchair users. Um, so, you know, I, I myself uh, have a, a disability. I have sleep apnea and also I've been diagnosed with thought disorder before by a, a, a psychiatrist. I don't agree with that diagnosis, but it's there and the stigma of diagnosis, it, it, you know, it doesn't go away. So yeah. uh, all of these things kind of have added up and, you know, made the decision, okay, this, this is the film I'm going to make. I want to make a film about disability. I want to make a film that being a film lover myself that kind of pokes and prods and pulls at all of the, the tropes that uh, the, 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 the misguiding tropes that we see uh, in film uh, portraying disability on screen. So that's been a big thing for me. My, my ethos is portray actual disabled people on screen because those are the images that we see. They're what's get that it, it's what gets represented, um, you know, that's, that ultimately plays into our perceptions of these people, many of whom uh, we don't even see uh, in the light of day because, you know, society as a whole is inherently not disability friendly. Um, that's, uh, you know, Tom Shakespeare uh, wrote about that in the 1980s, the social inclusion, theories of social inclusion, that disability is in the environment and not in the person. Um, so, you know, long story short, TLDR, uh, you know, th this film, the co-op uh, is, a, it's a short film, it's a grassroots film that hopefully exposes some people to some perspectives that they might not be used to seeing on the silver screen. Cool, cool. Now, um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is you had mentioned a word just a moment ago that my ears perked up when I heard this word. And I would imagine many listeners as well, and and that word is is diagnosis, which, which I, I say because there is tends there tends to be a conversation right now in a lot of mental health circles as far as that word, and what I mean by that is if someone receives information from their their doctor, whatever area of medicine that that might be. And there are some who say, oh, well, that's like, you know, it's, it's like Moses on, you know, whatever, you know, this is etched in stone forever. And then there are those who kind of challenge it or want a second opinion or third opinion or whatnot on that. Where, where do you stand on, on, on that, if at all? Uh, I'm pretty anarchistic uh, when it comes to psychiatry. Uh, it, I, I think that the DSM is, uh, it, that, that is a, a, a kind of archaic method. Uh, and, and this is a pretty controversial view <laughs> in the eyes of psychiatrists. Uh, yeah. my, my wife actually is currently in a grad program for a clinical psychiatry PhD. So she has plenty to say about this yeah. as well. Um, but, you know, I think if you look at like the writings of Goetz Ali, um, you know, people like that, they'll, they'll tell you that, you know, diagnosis needs to kind of be done, done away with, um, that, you know, the, the, the new, uh, treatment per se, first of all, is non-invasive, non-prescriptive and non-diagnostic. It should be, uh, holistic with the individual. So that's kind of, you know, my take on that. And the reason, the reason I mention 
that diagnosis that I've had is not because I, I identify with it, but to make the point that, hey, like many other people out there, I have been diagnosed at some point in my life. And, and you, you know, you can acknowledge it and not have to, to live with it to just make the point, you know, that it's not a part of you, but that it's out there that this is a, a behavior that many of us experience to the, the behavior of diagnosis, right? The nature of it. Def definitely, because there, there has tended to be and with the changing of the guard in uh, in, in Washington right now, um, there's been ongoing dialogue about what the mental health system in the U.S. is going to look like. And there are I, I've seen different stories about different government agencies and different people staffing those agencies who have various views, uh, various fields of medicine. Um, so, like I said, when you when you mentioned that word, my ears just just perked up because it's you're right. It is a um, somewhat of a, of a hot topic, uh, more so you know now through through the next few months. Yeah, absolutely, and you know uh, now more than ever, also with COVID, um, you know I think we're seeing the reemergence of some pretty scary eugenics. Uh, ideas, um, and these all come from the medical field. This is the entangled history of the deviant body and mind with, you know, the field of science and, and medical diagnosis and, you know, biology. Yeah. So uh, definitely, um, you know, something that we need to keep at the forefront uh, and and fight, you know, for a representation of the, the, the diagnosed, uh, so to say. And, um, you know, I, it's a, actually an interesting uh, segue. Um, the co-op, this film that I made, um, I, I made it kind of as to try and operationalize uh, this idea of narrative prosthesis, which uh, was coined by my parents, as I mentioned before, they're disability studies teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that, uh, in literature and film, since the dawn of time, disability has been operationalized um, as a plot device, essentially. Uh, you have somebody that we that looks different, that we point out and say, hey, look, this person is is unique uh, or they're 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 not the norm. And that 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 point is then made to introduce a story. Uh, and that story typically does not expand uh, upon that disability. It draws attention to it, uh, but it, it, it ultimately uh, looks at it to be solved. It's a, it's a disability to be solved. The, the, fourth, the third act of the film almost always cures or fixes uh, the disorder and the, the person can then reintegrate into normalized society. Um, and so the co-op looks at this robber who is in some ways misguided, he, but, but also uh, pushed to the brink of desperation. He's robbing a, gro a grocery store. Um, his, you know, he no longer has the means to survive in society. So he's decided uh, to rob a grocery store. And uh, he has his own prejudices against other, you know, people on the bottom rungs, so to say, of capitalist society, um, and which are revealed when he enters this grocery store and it turns out to be full of disabled people. Mm -hmm. uh, what can these disabled people offer him? Um, what, yeah. what insight or guidance, uh, you know, can, can be bestowed upon somebody who is threatening them uh, and, every, and, and the store itself? Uh, that's what the film looks to explore. Cool. Well, one um, one of the things that interests me about the, the this film is when I was growing up, there was an actual literal co-op uh, in my neighborhood, which has since been taken over by by uh, surprise surprise Whole Foods warehouse or whatever that store is. Or and um, but there was an actual literal co-op when I was growing up, and the people would pay their you know, was it 20 bucks at the time or it might have been 10 bucks or whatever and there would be uh, you know a bulletin board of different you know roommates wanted you know whatever that you know stuff they were selling or whatnot and that it, it it's kind of interesting that that you know it, it's in its name but that is ideally and, and i believe there are still some co-ops uh, you know in 2021 not as many as there should be, but um, it, it kind of points to just that element of community 
that you simply won't get <laughs> at a regular supermarket. You just, I'm sure there's some supermarkets that operate that way, but for the most part, you're not going to get that same level of, uh, of community. I love that reading. And <laughs> uh, as typical with the, the, the filmmaker and the, the film reviewer, uh, you have added depth that is accidental uh, in, in my realm. Uh, this, this film was actually originally based in a diner and it was called okay. The Diner. And uh, we lost that location at the last minute. The, the owner uh, kind of got wind of the idea of what I was shooting and they didn't like it. They didn't, they yeah. didn't like oh. that it was, I don't know, maybe they didn't like the violence or yeah. they, they thought it was gonna reflect poorly on their brand. Um, so a day before we get the call and we no longer have a location. Oh. Uh, and it turns out that my, uh, my, my sister-in-law, she worked at a co-op and she was an associate manager there and she was able to convince them to let us use the space. Oh, it cool. ended up being tremendously better for the film, I think. <laughs> and you are absolutely right that the, the co-op, it, it, it has a sense of community. And uh, what's even better is that in the film, one of the patrons even remarks like, what, you think that just because we're all disabled that there's, there's some setup here? Uh, because the robber gets like increasingly frustrated that he's running into all of the, the, these disabled patrons, and <laughs> and in the and in, in the patron says, you know, the, I only this is the only accessible store within a hundred miles of my house, uh, so they're kind of all brought together by this happenstance of accessibility, and you could say this happenstance of community, right? That you pointed out yeah. uh, that is a, a neighborhood co-op. Right. Yeah. And, and this place when I was growing up, I mean, they would have like, you know, book groups and meetings. They had the little meeting room in the back where they would have different community groups and organizations who would use their space for meetings that they had. Um, so I just I just wanted to, to acknowledge that 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 part of, of the story that I, I would imagine and again, I, 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 depending on where you are in the world listening to this, there may, there may, may, may or may not be a, a literal actual co-op in, in your neighborhood. But um, just hearing that word, it's, you know, it's kind of brings up, you know, from when I was little and, and there being an actual literal co-op in, in, in my neighborhood that, that definitely was a community resource. Yeah, it's funny. I've actually gone back and forth on the synopsis, changing the, the that the robber has targeted a co-op or he's targeted a grocery store <laughs> because I get worried that yeah, we not every everywhere might not have a co-op, and yeah. then people are like looking at the synopsis like, what the hell is a co-op? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what um, as as far as um, the 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 representation. In, um, in film, is there anything, are there any examples that, that you look at and you just, you just shake your head and like, what, what were they thinking? Absolutely, I think it's almost only littered with that. Uh, <laughs> I think it would be maybe more uh, uh, pointed to, to look at the, the admirable uh, movies or the ones yeah. that almost get it right, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, because there's just a litany of, of films that quote unquote get it wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, I, the, my usual go to's are films like The Sea Inside, My Left Foot, Million Dollar Baby, uh, more recently, The Upside with Brian Cranston. Uh, it's typically these films that one, don't cast disabled people in the roles of the people with the disability, in which, let me just go here and say, uh, you know, because somebody might say, well, acting is acting. And, you know, it's not about like you're you don't have to your role doesn't have to reflect who you are as an individual. I would say on the contrary, au contraire, that there, how else are you injecting real disability experience into this role? Because you're having somebody like, you you know, in the case of a physical disability, somebody who has the lived experience of being, and, and also in the case of a, a mental disability, somebody who has the lived experience of, of being in that brain, you know, yeah, <laughs> like being yeah. in that body or that brain. And, you know, how, how could an able-bodied actor possibly be able to, you know, convey that experience? And if you if you're even okay with that, and you're like, yeah, they can do it. Okay, well then, what about the writer? 
You know, what about the director? What about anybody yeah. in this chain of command? Uh, do any of them have a disability or have experience with disability it, it, to that deep extent? And I think that is, you know, what is affecting a lot of these movies and why we end up seeing Clint Eastwood try and portray that an effective solution to uh, a prize fighter becoming disabled is to euthanize them and that it's yeah. okay, you know, and that's the, that's the solution. You know, that's what you get when you cast that type of film that way. Yeah, wasn't there a film a couple of years ago? The the actress from Game of Thor Game Game of Thrones, and it was a, a, a and and by asking this, I'm, I'm probably spoiling it. Which, oops. I mean, it's, I, it's been out. It's been out. Yeah, um, but do you know which movie well, I'm talking? Do you know which one I'm talking about? Um. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Cause it wasn't advertised I, I, as- you said actress, I was gonna say, talk about Bran cause you know, Bran's a pretty central disabled yeah. character in that yeah. film. Um, and, and he falls into the trope of the magical disability. Yeah, you yeah. Know, the, like, like the magical Negro, he's the magical disabled yeah. person. Yeah. Um, but uh, actress, I'm trying to think. Um, if you, if you know, the, 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 uh, everyone listening is probably Googling it right now. What, what movie did this podcast say about? <laughs> oh. But I remember that when that came out, there was a huge uproar because it wasn't mentioned in any of the press material. And then people saw it and um, it was not last Christmas. There was a, a movie which is similar, but I don't think it was last Christmas. Um, but yeah, just, yeah, so... That, that, so you're saying that an actress from Game of Thrones was in another movie uh -huh. that uh, portrayed a disability? Uh -huh. Correct. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so everybody yeah. listening to the podcast, that's going to be your homework. <laughs> <laughs> search, <laughs> search for the, the movie starring <laughs> Clark, and then um, I don't know. So that that'll, that'll be your homework for uh, everybody listening. Um, now, now, before we had gone on the air, um, you had mentioned a movie that uh, I'm not a fan of at all. <laughs> One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Ouch! <laughs> ouch! <laughs> ouch! No. I... Okay, let me let me make the case here. Okay, for this movie because I understand and I want and, and it, it absolutely is flawed. It's it's deeply yeah. deeply flawed. Yeah. But uh, you know, as <laughs> you know, as you said, uh, you know, I think you said it's the birth of a nation for yeah <laughs> disability films. Yeah, uh, you know, like I said, you got to take what you can get at this point to in Hollywood's history. And um, the one thing I really like about One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is that you have this whole scene where there's a field trip. We have the field trip where all of the patients are taken out and they're given a day in the life, right? Of a non-institutionalized, uh, quote unquote, normal, like non-asylum uh, p potentiality, like this other life you could be living if only the nurses and caretakers that surrounded you would allow yeah. you to do so, uh, right? And I, I think that, you know, that scene always stuck with me as, you know, different from your the typical institution film, uh, you know, which is very much inside the institution uh, yeah. versus out. Yeah, because I, I, I think, for, speaking for, only for myself, and, and I, um, but my, my concern with the film is it has tended to be almost like weaponized. Like when people hear that someone has been um, in a hospital for, uh, for a mental disorder, there's almost like an immediate um, image of Jack Nicholson. <laughs> so, so maybe it's a complaint about how, how good Jack Nicholson was in the movie. Or, but, but I, it just seems like that's the perennial universal go-to when in actuality, those with a mental illness, it's like, I don't know what the statistic is, it's like barely one hundredth of 1% who commit violent crimes. And 
there's that element in like I, I didn't have a problem with 12 monkeys oddly enough mm. so if I, so i sort of wish everybody who loves what folks cuckoo's dust could rave about 12 monkeys or, or, or any terry gilliam movie I, 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 I love 12 monkeys yeah. i'm a huge terry gilliam <laughs> fan so we can the rest of this podcast can just be about terry gilliam's career i'd be happy yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean everything that people say they like about one Flew of the cuckoo's nest 12 monkeys did oh way so much better with mm. way so much even even brazil <laughs> i mean right. you talk about people who are getting you know with, with with all the the horror show uh going on with mental health um in the u.s and i mentioned in other countries as well uh, everything in brazil like perfectly captures what it's like navigating through all this bureaucracy and red tape about um, even di with disability. There's a lot of dis uh, and I'm referring to SSI disability, not the, um, but a lot of a lot of the processes with that. I mean, you, that's what Brazil. You know, you watch Brazil, and it's like, oh, that's someone's disability process that <laughs> that's that's being portrayed in this movie, because it's the whole movie is is him banging his head against the wall trying to get through and 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 that's what and and it's kind of a, there's a weird meta element of that because right. the brazil for those who don't know went through i don't i think it was barely released and then it finally got released because i think it might have been the la times or some paper some film critic bought a, a full page ad in variety or hollywood reporter saying come on guys release this movie so it got only released because people who saw it demanded for and this is obviously you know before the internet or right. anything like that so you but can't, that, it wouldn't be a terry gilliam film without the controversy around the film's release and every <laughs> one of the films has to have that it's essential to the plot of the movie yeah actually. yeah and then even even with uh, the whole don quixote movie even that uh, kind of speaks to a lot of uh you know what i, I had no idea we were talking about terry gilliam on this episode <laughs> I <laughs> but i mean i mean but think about it i mean everything in that terry gilliam the the, the don quixote one the man he that is, on yeah Quixote. that is so apropos to anyone living with you know depression or bipolar or whatnot because how is how is it not i mean the whole movie is about for those who don't know what the movie what i'm talking about it there's he, he wanted to make a man of la mancha and it's been one bad you know like orson welles it's like kind of what there's, orson welles wanted to be when he grew up you know and there's, a great, there's a great documentary by some fellow temple alums i went to temple university called lost in la mancha that kind of documents gilliam's mm -hmm. uh attempted failures at originally yeah. making Don Quixote. Uh, this film is very different, I think, from what he uh, initially entered True. into. True. Um, so yeah, I just mentioned that because navigating through, you know, mental health and even even a lot of mental health agencies, some of which I, I mentioned on the podcast because they do good work. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> them doing good work doesn't negate from a lot of the bureaucracy that people will often encounter. Um, right. So and, I, and I think um, as uh, my friend and uh, a scholar, Robert McRuer says, uh, disability is sometimes best interpreted in works that do, do not appear to be disability works, mm -hmm. right? Or something of that flavor. It's like mm -hmm. uh, the most rich interpretations can arise from something that we might not perceive as about disability. And I think mm -hmm. You're absolutely right that Brazil and and Don, the man who killed Don Quixote, maybe a little more directly in that film. Mm -hmm. I think he, he he comes more directly at mental health, especially you know, I mean this is the uh, I don't no spoilers because also the film had a limited release. I don't know how many people have actually seen the man who killed Don Quixote. I saw it the first day it came out in theaters yeah. uh, for a limited four day release. Yeah. Or, uh, but you know the windmill and the, the the symbology of kind of this turning windmill and and the town that comes together to uh, create or to to enhance his imagination uh, in some ways is it the town or is it his imagination is it his experience 
uh, you're, you, there's this ambiguity uh, mm -hmm. there that I, I really like that Gilliam plays with there. Um, but it, Brazil, it's, it's definitely all subtext, you know, mm -hmm. like, yes, it's the film itself is a critique of this, you know, vented society. <laughs> the vents are just the rampant capitalism, like left to run amok. And then Robert De Niro is this, you know, fixer <laughs> of, uh, of the vents, but even yeah. he can't, you know, no. truly fix the, the vents. Um, so, you know, and then you've got the face stretching, plastic yeah. surgery, all of the wonderful motifs of a, a Terry Gilliam film, which is yeah. highly critical of our capitalist society and surviving in it. Uh, you know, those are all, I think, more sub, uh, the, the, that critique is above ground, but then the mm -hmm. disability subtext, you have to unpack it. You would have to look and be like, wait, um, yeah, Tuttle and Buttle getting lost in the bureaucracy of, of names and numbers and being in a system uh, that all is very clearly a disability context. Yeah, um, but yeah, the Terry Gill movie, that's the episode I didn't know that I need to have that I definitely got to have to dig deeper on, on a future episode. So um, yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but but one thing um, I, I, I did want, and, and this probably speaks to this, is it does seem like, and not just seems like, but it, you know, probably I'm sure that 99% Point nine nine true is that a lot of um, independent film and, and I and I do mean the the, the literal definition not the um, Sundance definition but the actual literal definition uh, will tend to be the movies that tell the stories that you're simply not going to see in a movie like a million dollar baby or um, you know, one floor of the cuckoo's nest, for example. Um, I mean, do, do you do you think? I mean, do you, do you agree with with that sentiment, or do you think that that the the mainstream Hollywood movies that they're catching catching up little by little? Uh, yeah, no, I definitely think that we have a long way to go. And um, it, it, it didn't become more pertinent than uh, in the, the filmmaker uh, preparatory meeting for, for Slamdance the other day, um, you know, because Sundance and Slamdance, a lot of festivals are starting to create a category for movies about uh, physical and mental disabilities, right? That's become the, the, the hot topic, the hot, you know, couture of of film festivals, because yes, they're supposed to be these bastions of unheard stories of, of new and different perspectives. Um, but even in uh, Slamdance, uh, I learned the other day that there is no juried award in our category. The, cat the, the program is called Unstoppable, and it's supposed to be about you know pe short, short films uh, about people with disabilities. Um, and the only award that they're offering is an audience award. And one of the other filmmakers in the chat pointed out, rightly, um, we would like a jury to review these films. You know, uh, what's the point of a film festival without film critics, you know, uh, uh, commenting and, and absorbing the material? You know, how do we get this material in front of, you know, eyes that, you know, matter to, to the film industry in, 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 in some respect? Um, so, you know, it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a continual progress, right? Um, and I can definitely say though, that if you go to a festival like Slamdance, which by the way, you can this year from the comfort of your own couch, mm -hmm. you can sign up and it doesn't even, it won't even cost you a penny. You can sign up right now until December 31st on their website for a free pass and you get access to all of the films, all of the content that you would see at any slam dance festival without having to trudge through the uh, snow trodden uh, hallways of the hotel that they hosted in. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, do that. And uh, people who uh, might not even be, have never been to a film festival, I think it's a good opportunity uh, to see kind of what it's all about and what this programming looks like. You know, because it is very different from, say, a Sundance or, you know, from your local movie theater. Oh, definitely. Um, so, yeah. For, can you repeat that again for those who were listening and, and might not have noted, like, for those who want to get a pen and paper, write it down. Can, yeah. can you can you repeat that again for those who, because, yeah. and, I, and I can attest to that. I Not slam down in particular, but um, actually to some extent, yeah, because I know that there have been some Sundance titles that have screened elsewhere, but, but yeah, how would people find, find out about that? 
So you go, you go to www.slamdance.com and there's a big banner at the top of the site that says register for your pass or get your pass now. Uh, you just click that and you put in your email and sign up and you have to do that by December 31st, I'm told. After December 31st, they're going to start charging uh, admittance. But if you're on the ball right now, you can get in for free. And then the festival will premiere on February 12th. And it goes from the February 12th to the 14th. Okay, good deal. Good deal. Well, well, congratulations with the with the success of the, of the continued success of, of, of the film. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's 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 been uh, you know this film we shot it in 2017. Um, it started or 2018, sorry, and it started hitting the festival circuit in 2019. Um, it's been to over a dozen film festivals internationally. Uh, from Bur Bergen, New Jersey to Barcelona, Spain, as I like cool. to say. Cool. Um, I was even flown out to Barcelona for that festival. So it's cool. been a, it's, cool. whoever cool. knew a short film could give one such yeah. uh, lavish experiences. Cool. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been quite a ride and to be recognized by Slam Dance now. And, um, you know, they... This is the ink is apparently still drying on this deal, but uh, Slam Dance is uh, working with Hulu this year, mm -hmm. so uh, there there is a distribution uh, potential. Uh, or I, from what I understand, mm -hmm. uh, for all of the films in Slam Dance to be on Hulu later uh, in 2021. So if you miss it the first time at Slam Dance, you can definitely check it out uh, at uh, uh, there and also on the Slam Dance site because uh, my film, uh, as well as many others, have signed a non-exclusive agreement with Slam Dance. Um, so you can actually just go to their YouTube channel, or you should be able to go to their YouTube channel after February uh, 14th uh, and view the films. Cool, cool. Well, that's, like I said, that's some, one of the um, happy about seeing 2021 uh, films. That is, because you know what I mean? Because there's that, that, that traditional calendar whereby all the LA and New York movies, those are the ones that get released to the rest of the country in January and February, because everything else, the new releases are typically crap, you know, let's be honest. But the recycled ones from the, you know, those are the ones that are typically the only ones worth seeing in January. So I'm very happy that there is a good movie that's gonna be available to watch in 2021. So definitely for those listening, and, and anyway, I will um, be checking this out um, as well. Um, now, I, I do want to mention, uh, as we wind down, I, I do want to mention um, a, a few additional resources. I know that there have been so, some topics discussed that um, you, know, you may be looking for help with and whatnot. So I, I did want to just um, mention Mental Health America, MHA National, Dot org. There's also National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org. There is madinamerica.com. They have a lot of the, the, the uh, research and um, whatnot on that. But um, Cameron, uh, thank you for being here today. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is really a fantastic podcast and uh, I, I wish you great success in your, your future episodes. Oh, thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, thank you, um, those of you at home or driving to work or, or from work um, or wherever you may be. Um, stay safe, everyone, and um, talk to you next time. Uh, bye.